Right, comrades, today black people suffer from various forms of racial imp uh, oppression. In general, black workers are paid lower wages than white workers, are twice as likely to be unskilled, and twice as likely to live in worse housing conditions than white workers. Thus, the reality of racial oppression is not in question. Now, for socialists, an understanding of the origins and nature of oppression is vital if we are to change society. Indeed, to abolish capitalism requires the unity of black and white workers. Racism is an obstacle to such unity, and therefore is an obstacle to a socialist transformation of society. Now, having said that, there exists a number of explanations for racism. The dominant view is that racism is simply the result of people holding horrible, irrational ideas uh, about black people. Now, this view is summed up uh, by Neil Kinnock in an interview with the New Statesman. He said that racism was not related to history or property values, but concerned ridiculous superstitions about the nature of black skin. Now, indeed, racism partly involves this. The idea that people are deemed inferior because of their physical characteristics is a very strange one. But nevertheless, such a view being put forward doesn't really begin to provide an explanation for the origin of this idea, and more specifically, it doesn't locate any material base for, for, for its existence. Now, a second explanation for racism is that it is somehow endemic and in inherent in so-called white society. Now, this is a profoundly pessimistic view, because if by the mere fact of being white means you're inherently racist, then logically, there's no hope for black liberation. Logically, it's futile to fight the racist. Uh, the only solution is to organise separately from uh, whites in, in, in society. Now, both of these views actually fail to locate the origins, the root cause of racism, and both see racism as something which is e eternal and, and something which is unchanging. And none of these explanations are able to come to terms with a very important fact that racism varies in quality uh, 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 and degree from one period of history to, to another. Neither can explain why some whites are racist and yet other whites are actively anti-racist. Now, it's only from a Marxist perspective which we can really uh, uh, get to grips with uh, racism. It's a perspective which treats racism as a historically specific, materially caused phenomenon. Now, contrary to popular belief, racism is not a universal feature of all societies. It's a very distinct form of oppression. Racism is a discrimination against people on the grounds that some inherited characteristic which is attributed to them, for example, colour, makes them inferior to their oppressors. Now, this particular form of oppression, I will argue, is a product of capitalism. It arose out of early capitalism's needs uh, for the slaves in the plantations of the New World. It was then further consolidated to justify Western domination of the rest of the world actually flourishes today as a means of dividing indigenous and uh, immigrant workers. So we can see three forms of racism. Plantocracy racism, the racism of slavery, and the pseudo-scientific of empire building. And, and uh, the most common form of racism today, anti-immigrant racism. Now if we look to free class societies, especially those of Greece and Rome, this particular form of oppression did not exist. Now oppression certainly existed. Because these societies are actually based on the brutal exploitation of slave labour. Nevertheless, the idea that people were inferior because of inherited characteristics uh, would have been a, a very ridiculous idea. As black people in these societies indeed formed part of the ruling class, actually took leading positions. Septimus Severus and St. Augustine were amongst uh, several black Roman emperors. Now let's think about this for a moment. So I think it clearly illustrates the huge gap between those forms of societies and capitalism today. Today, the bourgeoisie puts over a view that somehow we are all equal. And yet Jesse Jackson today in the States, 100 years after slavery was abolished, will not get the nomination for the Democratic Party, yet alone the presidency. There's a one very simple reason. He's black. Now, the ancients did justify oppression. But they did so on the basis of, of uh, culture and not race. Either you were civilised or you were a barbarian. And you, be you could become civilised, for example, by learning to speak the uh, 
Greek, uh, Greek uh, language. Now, the real rise of racism and this oppression based on culture is profoundly different to that based on race. You can acquire culture. However, if you're black, you can't become white. Now, the real rise of racism begins in the 17th century with the rise of mercantile capitalism and the transatlantic slave trade in particular. And it is this, the slavery in the New World, which is, which is the historical context in which racism arose. Now, the emerging European powers at this time, Spain, Portugal, uh, England and France, actually set about their conquest of the New World. And the ensuing scramble for profits had led to the reappearance of slavery on the world stage. Now, in the Caribbean, the southern colonies, the production of uh, sugar and cotton and tobacco provided the basis for an extremely profitable export market. However, this profitability could only be maintained by the use of slaves. Now, this didn't reflect the individual nastiness or the individual meanness of these plantation owners. I'm sure they were these things, and a lot more, but more, more importantly, it reflected the needs of production. You see, to any capitalist, the economic superiority over free hard labour it, uh, over slave labour is quite obvious. Slave labour is given reluctantly, it's unskillful, lacks versatility, you have to look after it, etc. So other things being equal, free hard labour would be preferred. But in the early stages of colonial development, other things were not equal. Free hard labour is actually not compelled to work in the harsh conditions typical of a sugar and cotton estate. The labourer can decide to go off and work his own bit of land, own bit of soil uh, for himself. Now, without this command and compulsion, profitable uh, production of sugar and cotton would not have uh, got off the ground. And additionally, the limited population of Europe in the 16th century meant that uh, free labourers, free hired labourers willing to sell their labour power, uh, were, not, uh, uh, were not sufficient in numbers to me. To, to meet the uh, needs of the uh, plantations. Slavery was necessary for this to occur. Now, one of the most common myths around today is that uh, Africans were chosen as slaves because the, uh, the uh, plantation owners, the plantocracy, were, were racist. That is, it was racism which led to slavery rather than slavery uh, leading to racism. Now, this is a myth I think we have to expose because unfree labour in the New World was indeed black, brown, white, yellow, Catholic, Protestant and pagan. Indeed, the first slaves in the, uh, in the New World were not Africans, but the native Indians. However, for the plantocracy, the enslavement of the Indians proved to be inefficient. The Spaniards, for example, soon discovered that one Negro was worth four Indians. However, the successor of the Indian was not the Negro, but the poorer sections of British society, the poor whites. Now, there had been white slaves in England, but by the 16th century, they were virtually non-existent. And indeed, by the 15th century, the enslavement of Christians was regarded as abhorrent. So it was politically and socially untenable to uh, enslave Christians. So you found that the initial justification for the enslavement of Indians uh, was that they were unbelievers, that they weren't Christians. Now, this unfree... Labour consisted, uh, unfree white labour, consisted firstly of indentured servants or bond slaves, people bound by contract to work on the plantations for a number of years. It consisted of redemptioners, people who had to pay for their passage over in a given period of time. If they didn't, they were sold off to the highest bidder. And thirdly, they consisted of convicts, prisoners sent out by the uh, home government. Now, this traffic in, in, in white bond slaves was quite important. Between 1654 and 1685, 10,000 sailed from Bristol uh, to the West Indies and Virginia. And it's been estimated that a half of all English immigrants at this time were, were bond slaves. Now, kidnapping of whites took place in, in London and Bristol to such an extent that a new word appeared. To Barbados, a person meant shipping them off to, to the West Indies. 
And towards the end of the 17th century, you found attempts being made to prevent this kid kidnapping, to prevent the shipping of prisoners uh, uh, being, being made through various acts and bills in Parliament. But however, they came to nothing. They were rejected. Such was the importance of uh, the trafficking in, in white bomb, bomb slaves at this time. And uh, the plantation owners of Montserrat in 1680 had this to say. Not one of these colonies ever was or ever can be brought to any considerable improvement without a supply of white servants and Negroes. Now, once in the plantation colonies, these white bond slaves were treated in a, in a similar way to the Negroes. As far as a plantation owner was concerned, they, they were only there for a limited period of time. He was less concerned about their welfare than that of the Negroes, who were perpetual servants and, more, and therefore far more important for, for the plantations. As we see, these white bond slaves also feeling the, the lash of the whip, being bracketed together with the uh, Negroes and regarded as uh, white trash. Now, I presented such a picture so we could get a view of how, how white people treated white people. This, this was the nature uh, 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 of uh, the way things were at, at that moment. However, the institution of uh, bond slavery was not to last, because the supply was becoming increasingly difficult to maintain. Indentured servants and convicts uh, were not forthcoming in numbers to meet uh, the, the labour demands uh, of the plantation, uh, 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 plantation estates. And most important of all, and this was really the decisive factor, the Negro slave was cheaper. The governor of Barbados declared three blacks were better and cheaper than one white man. Indeed, the money required to get uh, a, a, a white bond slave for ten, ten years could get a Negro for life. And so, for these economic reasons then, we begin to see the rise of slavery increasingly associated with Africans. Eric Williams, in his important book, Capitalism and Slavery, uh, puts it like this. He says, Thus the origins of Negro slavery was economic, not racial. It had to do not with the colour of the labourer, but the cheapness of the labourer. And thus we're faced with a situation where all the slave owners were white, and increasingly all the slaves were becoming black. And later it became useful for the slave, uh, slave owners to justify the inhuman uh, treatment of slaves on the basis of an increasingly racist ideology. Now, which, which we'll come on to later, but now... Uh, now, now, the production of sugar and cotton uh, by African slaves was of tremendous importance to the emerging colonial powers, especially Britain, which by the end of the 18th century was responsible for over half of the uh, Atlantic slave trade. Ships left England with manufactured goods to be bought for slaves on the African coast. Slaves were taken over to the West Indies, uh, <coughs> exchanged for sugar and cotton, sugar and cotton going back back to England and Seoul. So a highly profitable triangular trade developed. All the ships didn't have to be empty. There was a profit to be made at each stage, stage of the journey. Now, the merchant capitalists, the industrial capitalists, the plantation owners benefited to an enormous extent. By the end of the 18th century, whole sections of the uh, ruling class were falling over themselves in amazement at the uh, profits being rigged. Now statistics at this time being put forward by these people showed that a single slave on the sugar plantations was worth 130 times more uh, than uh, a worker in England. And in particular, this super exploitation of, of African slaves did one thing, it spurred on the development of manufacturing uh, in industry in, in, in Great uh, uh, Britain. Now, the cotton spurred on the British textile industries. James Watt's steam engine to, uh, got part of its finance from, from the uh, slave trade, together with the Great Western Railway. Uh, South Wales and South Yorkshire the, were able to develop its coal and uh, iron industries. And it led to a whole surge of finance and banking institutions. Families like Barclays and Lloyds getting their initial capital from the uh, slave trade. And Marx put it like this. He said the colonial system ripened like a hothouse. The treasures captured outside Europe by undisguised looting, uh, 
enslavement and murder floated back to the mother country and were there turned into capital. Now, without the blood and sweat of the Negro slaves, Britain could never have emerged as the leading imperialist power at this, uh, at, at this time. And Marx also pointed to the barbarism involved in such a system when he said that the overworking of the Negro and the using up of his life in seven years of labour became a factor in a calculated and calculating system. Now, it was under these conditions that racism was formed to justify the most appalling and inhuman treatment of black people in the service of the greatest accumulations of wealth that humanity up till then had seen. Now, C.L.R. James also supports this view of the origins of racism when he puts forward this view. The conception of dividing people by race begins with the slave trade. This thing was so shocking, so opposed to all conceptions of society which religion and philosophers had, that the only justification by which humanity could face it was to divide people into races and decide the Africans were an inferior race. Now, it's important to say that the justification for slavery wasn't straight away, it wasn't initially, all of a sudden, a thought-out uh, set of racist ideas. Now, on the co contrary, we're not crude materialists, just to, put, uh, to, to say that. The way we see uh, racism beginning to emerge is, is quite gradual, it's quite tentative, quite slow. So, in the early years, what's interesting is, is that the early years of, in the early years of settlement, the plantocracy uh, began to refer them, uh, themselves, to, to began, began to contrast themselves with the Negro by the term Christian. And by the mid-17th century, uh, they were calling themselves Englishmen and then freemen. And only uh, by the 1680s, taking the colonies as a whole, do we find a new term uh, appearing, white. They increasingly begin to call themselves white and, and regard the Negro uh, uh, as black. That black and white distinction doesn't appear until the 1680s. Now, the duty of these good uh, white Christian plantation owners uh, as Christians, was to convert unbelievers to Christianity. Now this led the planters in, into a dilemma. This converting their black slaves to Christianity and baptising them would in theory actually mean setting them free. However, the church at this time was not, uh, not worried about the institution of slavery as such, but more concerned about uh, the planters' refusal to convert their slaves. And you found that in the controversy which actually uh, developed, you found the planters beginning to argue that blacks indeed had no souls at all, and indeed that they were uh, not human beings at all. Now Morgan, Morgan Godwin, who was a minister of religion at this time, uh, described the attitude of these planters, and his, his description is given by Peter Fryer in pre Peter Fryer's book, uh, Staying Power. Uh, this is what the planters said. What? Such as they, they cried. What? Those black dogs be made Christians? And they demanded to know whether ministers of religion would start baptising horses. Now, this was really the dawn of racism. It's here we see a shift from viewing Negroes as somehow different to one of viewing them as uh, subhuman. And so we begin to see in 1692, in Maryland, for example, the uh, outlawing of sexual relations between blacks and whites. But still at this time, by the end of the 17th century, racism as an ideology was still in the process uh, of uh, being formed. It was only in the middle of the 18th century that racism found its way into the uh, printed word. And by the end of that century, it became a coherent set of ideas used to justify the most degrading forms of slavery. Edward Long, an absentee planter, writing at the height of the slave trade, had this to say. Nor do orangutans seem at all inferior in the intellectual faculties to many of the Negro race, with some of whom it is credible that they have the most intimate connection and consanguinity. The amorous intercourse between them may be frequent, and it is certain that both races agree perfectly well in less, vicious, in, in less viciousness uh, of disposition. And we find that uh, in 1771, the, the philosopher, the philosopher David Hume, writing in, in, in these terms, 
and I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was a civilised nation of any other complexion than white, or even any individual eminent in either action or speculation, no ingenious manufacturers among them, no art, no, uh, no uh, sciences. So we begin to see then the development of a systematic characterisation of uh, black people uh, as uh, being uh, stupid, brutish uh, and ignorant. And that real systematic characterisation taking place thoroughly only in, in the middle of the uh, 19th uh, century. Now I think it's important to stress then that racism took, took, a, took, uh, took quite a time to develop and take root as an ideology, ideology that it didn't just develop overnight, having been first uh, 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 pro being propagated by the plantation owners uh, to justify slavery. So therefore we can see how spectacularly unnatural uh, this ideology was. Now, an additional factor, factor which led to the characterisation of blacks as subhuman was that parallel to the development of capitalism in the 17th century was the growing notion that all human beings were equal. Indeed, our own ruling class came to decisive power with the English and French revolutions. Uh, with the ideas of equality between human beings and freedom of the individual. And the, the enslavement of blacks was just a crystal clear contradiction of uh, such ideas. And thus this contradiction for the ruling class could only be resolved by uh, claiming that the black slaves, conveniently differentiated uh, by their colour, were, were subhuman. Now let's think about this for a moment. You see, in pre-capitalist class societies, Greece and Rome, there was actually no notion of equality between all human beings. What you had in these societies was structured inequality. Slavery was regarded as part of the natural hierarchical order of the world in which everything had its uh, place. Thus it, thus it didn't require any specialised ideology to justify it. What, it. what the rulers did mean was just naked, brutal force to keep the uh, slaves in their position. Thus, for the rulers of the ancient world, the institution of slavery didn't contradict their worldview uh, in, in a way it did for the emerging ruling class under capitalism. The latter wrote off half the population of the world as subhuman in order to justify profits from slavery. Now, as the economy evolved, slavery no longer fitted the needs uh, of uh, capitalist development. You found... Uh, that slave, the slave trade was abolished in 1807 and slavery in 1833. Now, did, did, did this mean that uh, racism was done away with? No, on the contrary. Capitalism was now off its knees and able to walk on two feet. This meant racism emerged in a more powerful and rejuvenated form as the ideology of empire. Now, three features uh, characterise this racism of empire. It was pseudo-scientific, it was paternalistic and it was nationalistic. So from the 1840s to the 1890s, the golden age of the British Empire was also the golden age of British racism. Now the scientific racism, which developed along with it, uh, gave racism a new intellectual credibility. Phrenology, for example, was a pseudoscience which was supposedly able to tell people's character from the contours of, of, of uh, skulls. Now, that served... Uh, from the start as a prop to racism. Measurements of skull size and shape ended up proving the assumptions of racial superiority which these uh, so-called scientists had. So in 1819, Sir William Lawrence could write, uh, the Negro structure appro approximates unequivocally to that of a monkey. I deem the moral and intellectual character of the Negro inferior and decidedly, decidedly so to that of the European. Horrible, nasty, vicious pseudo-scientific, pseudo-scientific racism. Now, when Charles Darwin publishes uh, Origin of the Species in 1859, he actually gave a blow to the races. Uh, he gave a blow to the racist myth that Africans were somehow uh, a different uh, species of humanity. And he, indeed, stressed the profound commonality between all blacks and whites. However, such was the degree of, uh, of acceptance of these ideas of racial superiority that his work was seized upon 
by these so-called scientists of race and distorted. And what followed was social Darwinism. Now, this school of thought applied Darwin's ideas to society at large, to sociology. And it was led by Herbert Spence, who first originated the term survival of the fittest. And he actually applied the evolutionary process to the development of society, believing that whites were becoming uh, naturally superior and, uh, and indeed the extermination, the elimination of inferior races would actually help the development of uh, humanity. Now all these so so-called scientific inquiries justified empire building. They put forward a view that uh, the dark races of the world were somehow incapable uh, of governing themselves and thus had to be ruled over by the superior European races. Now Lord Luggard who spent 30 years engaged in administrative rule over Ugandans and Nigerians, said that the typical black African was a happy, thriftless, excitable person, lacking in self-control, discipline and foresight. In brief, the virtues and defects of this race type are those of attractive children. Still, still racism, still racism, the stereotype of blacks remain. There's still, you know... The, they, they're lacking in discipline, self-control, etc. The stereotype of, of blacks remain. However, Africans are not regarded now as subhuman, but are regarded uh, as children. Children who aren't able to take up the responsibility of self-administration. Thus, for the colonialists, imperialist plunder was justified as philanthropy, charity work, backed up uh, with the so-called uh, results of uh, science. Now, it's important to realise that racism was not confined to a handful uh, of cranks, and into, uh, a handful of cranks. Virtually every scientist and intellectual in 19th century Britain took it for granted that only people with white skin were capable of thinking and governing. And scientific thought accepted uh, race superiority and inferiority well in, into the 20th century. And only in the past uh, 50, 40 years, with the defeat of Hit Hitler and the barbarism that that, uh, that involved, has scientific racism uh, lost uh, intellectual respectability. Now, as Britain was engaged in empire building, the role of the nation state was becoming more and more important for ensuring uh, profits uh, being made abroad. Now, the material reality of the nation state uh, meant that nationalism became the flip side of the coin to racism. Now this ar allowed the ruling class to, at home to appeal to the working class as part of a national community in opposition to, to other nation states. Thus it enabled the ruling class to blur class uh, distinctions. It didn't matter if you were a chimney sweep or a fat landed aristocrat. The fact that you belonged to the same nation state was uh, deemed more important. So you found people like... Uh, Sir Arthur Keith, as late as 1931, uh, attempting to provide a scientific justification uh, for the link between race and, race and nation, saying, a nation always represents an attempt to become a race, nation and race are but uh, different degrees of the same evolutionary process. Thus, the ideas of race and nation, because of the material reality of the nation state, allowed capitalism to put forward these ideas as, as, as two of its most potent ideological symbols and therefore it could justify not only domination of whites over blacks but domination of, of other white races over certain other different uh, white races. Now as capitalism aged, racism no longer justified empire building abroad but increasingly served to divide uh, workers at home on the basis of opposition to uh, immigrants. Now this Anti-immigrant racism is the most common form of racism today. Capitalism has seen whole waves uh, of immigration. The Irish into Britain in the 1840s, Europeans into America in the 1920s, and in the 50s in Britain, uh, uh, <coughs> Asians and West Indians coming into the country following the uh, post-war boom. Now this shifting of workers around the globe provides the basis, on the one hand, of breaking down cultural divisions and barriers between workers, but also, on the other, provides a basis for the employing class to encourage splits within the workforce. 
So in Britain, in the 1840s, it was the Irish who suffered from racism, despite their colour. Marx indeed compared them to uh, the blacks in America. Now the key to this anti-immigrant racism is that immigrant workers are seen as competitors, competitors for jobs and housing. And it's this competition which gives uh, anti-immigrant racism its material base in society. Now it's important to state that then racism doesn't simply operate on on, on the uh, level of ideas. There is a material reality to it, which uh, which is why uh, workers accept racist ideas. Because today, black people uh, do get the worst jobs, do get the worst housing conditions, their material position in society, in, in reality, is worse off than white workers, is inferior to white workers. So for backward workers who lack class consciousness, then there is uh, uh, little to convince them that indeed whites are somehow are better than, than blacks, that blacks are responsible for unemployment and uh, poor housing conditions, etc. Now these racist ideas are only held because they are able, in one way or another, to correspond uh, to the material experience, that, to the material reality uh, of uh, workers. Now this situation uh, unfortunately applied to the Irish uh, in the 1840s as it does to blacks today. Karl Marx was the first to put forward an analysis of this uh, anti-immigrant racism. He wrote, and I quote, And most important of all, every industrial and commercial centre in England now possesses a working class divided into two hostile camps, English proletarians and Irish proletarians. The ordinary English worker hates the Irish worker as a competitor who lowers his standard of life. In relation to the Irish worker, he feels himself a member of the ruling nation and so turns himself into a tool of the aristocrats and capitalists of this country against Ireland, thus strengthening their domination over himself. And Marx goes on to say that this antagonism is artificially kept alive and intensified by the press, the pulpit, the comic papers, in short, by all means at the disposal of the ruling classes. Now this antagonism is the secret of the impotence of English English working class, despite its organisation. It's a secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power, and that class is fully aware of it. Now, there are a number of important points to draw out from Marx's analysis. Firstly, he locates a material base for this anti-immigrant racism as competition, competition between workers. Secondly, he says that this antagonism is artificially kept alive. Now, if racism was a natural, inherent response within white people, there would be no need for for papers like The Sun to continually pump out racist filth to to whip up the racism. Thirdly, Marx says that this antagonism is a secret of the impotence of the working class. Rather than benefiting white workers, it strengthens the domination of the ruling class over white workers. As racism doesn't benefit white workers, it benefits the capitalist class and the rule of capital. The ruling class fosters racism because it serves their own interests in in, in being able to divide uh, and and weaken workers. Okay, now I want to bring together some of the main points of this talk. Firstly, is that we can only understand racism if, if it's placed into a historical context. Having done that, we see that uh, racism has not existed throughout history, far from being eternal, it's a product specifically of capitalism, arising out of the plantation slavery in the New World. And this view actually rules out the fact that white people uh, are inherently racist. And far from being unchanging, the different forms uh, racism has taken can only be understood in relation to the way that capitalism itself has has changed, and changed social relationships because of it. And thus a strategy aimed at fundamentally abolishing capitalism, established socialism, will actually provide that material base uh, uh, for the eradication of racism. Now, secondly, racism is not necessarily uh, about colour at all. This we've seen in the case of the Irish. Also, with the uh, Jews uh, and the Nazis, the Nazis had to force the Jews to wear the Star of David as they lacked any sort of physical distinctiveness. So once at a given point in history, 
the ideas of racial superiority have developed, then it becomes easy for ruling classes to scapegoat different groups on the basis of these ideas. Now, people point to the persecution of Jews throughout history as evidence of racism existing prior to capitalism. Now, it would be right to regard modern anti-Semitism as a form of racism. However, you, I, I think it would be wrong to extend this, uh, this uh, characterisation back throughout history. Because indeed, although Jews have been oppressed throughout history, the form of the oppression that they have faced has been religious in character rather than racial in, in character. And this is significant, I think, because it illustrates that Jews had the possibility of actually changing the religion. Abraham Leon, in his book The Jewish Question, actually points to the fact that in the Middle Ages, um, the oppression of Jews was uh, religious rather than racial. And he, in, indeed, that the Jews were attacked primarily uh, in their role as merchants, as usurers, as money lenders. And where Jews tended to move away from such distinct economic uh, roles, they tended to lose uh, their religion, and, and, and sooner or later they, 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 they converted. And when they moved away from such a distinct economic role, they no longer became the object of persecution. And only at the end of the 19th century do we see real racial anti-Semitism beginning to take root in Western Europe uh, and in Russia with the pogroms against the uh, Jews. Here the attacks were not on a specific socio-economic group as before, but against any type of Jews. Uh, workers, whatever, people who had descended from uh, people who had practiced uh, a certain religion and inherited not an acquired characteristic. Now, this, this is really the meaning of racial anti-Semitism, quite different, quite significantly different uh, to religious anti-Semitism. Now, going back to the plantation slavery of the New World then, we see that racism had a profound advantage over the justification of slavery by religion or by culture. Because it's easy to simply acquire these things. However, if you're black, you can't become white. So what's crucial to racism is the notion of inherited characteristics. The relationship between the superior to the inferior, which, deem them, uh, which make them inferior because of these characteristics. Now, uh, if all the slave masters and indeed be black in, in the uh, plantation colonies, and all the slaves be white, no doubt we'd have seen the development of uh, uh, an ideology of black uh, superiority. It's important to stress uh, when we talk about racism today that the nature of racism has also changed. That is indeed part of the uh, next talk in, in this series. The nature of racism has shifted. Attitudes have changed from the 50s to the 80s. They no longer tend to openly denounce black people uh, uh, as inferior. A number of complicated reasons have brought this about. Now, although racism grew up with capitalism there, and is part of its dynamic, capitalism has also created its own grave figure. It has created a potential force to do away with r racism. It's created a proletariat, a working class, which has a material interest uh, in fighting racism and whose interest it is to unite the working class, whether black, white, Jewish or Irish. And this is not just a mere act of faith or a mere act of hope in the working class. It doesn't just happen occasionally. It, we can see right uh, from the very beginnings of working class struggle that when workers are forced to struggle, forced to fight back, then they begin to take on the ideas of racism. That's the French masses at the time of the French Revolution who moved to throw the uh, monarchy, began to take up the issue of slavery, began to argue it. And at the same time in the French colonies, we saw the biggest slave revolt ever in history uh, <coughs> in San Domingo, led by Toussaint Louverture, a black slave. Uh, this mighty slave revolt, the only successful one in his history, was reflected uh, within the Par Parisian working class with great enthusiasm. In Britain, during the 18th century, we saw the radical wings of the artisan movement, uh, especially in the big cities, beginning to organise in, in the first embryonic forms of trade unions, things called corresponding societies. They began to take up the issue of slavery. They took up the issue of slavery in a far more deeper and profound, profound way than the quite vocal middle-class anti-slavery movement uh, at that time. This middle-class anti-slavery movement arose 
primarily uh, because slavery no longer fitted the requirements of British capitalism. In particular, Britain was competing with France, who still needed slaves, and who got their slaves from the uh, British slave trade. Therefore, this middle-class movement fitted a whole wing of the ruling class who wanted, to, who wanted the slave trade ended <coughs> in order to weaken their, their, their deadly rivals, in order to weaken French uh, capitalism. However, the artisans in these corresponding societies went beyond this. They said that liberty was indivisible. If they were fighting for liberty for white workers in London, they could do nothing other than fight for the liberty of black slaves in the West Indies. And they call for the wholesale uh, abolition of slavery and the emancipation of, of slaves. Unlike the middle class movement, who just wanted the uh, trading in slaves to be ended. In 1792, Manchester had a population of 75,000. You found that no less than 20,000 signed a petition calling for the abolition of slavery. In 1794, you saw the biggest mass... Uh, 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 mass meeting ever in Sheffield, in the history of Sheffield up to that point, calling for wholesale emancipation of slaves. They said, wishing to be rid of the weight of oppression under which we groan, we are induced to compassionate those who groan also. No compromise can be made between freedom and tyranny. Now such was the mood around the issue of slavery that the government had to ban all public meetings in 1795. And soon, you began to see, amongst the most radical, the vanguard uh, of the emerging working class, British working class, a realisation that petitioning was not enough. And you began to see, especially in London, with the corresponding societies, these first combinations of workers, you began to see them smuggling out the first forms of revolutionary propaganda to the slaves in the West Indies. Again, with the same idea that if they were fighting for freedom in London that they could do nothing else but support and agitate for the freedom of slaves in the West Indies. Now, amongst the leader, leaders of this revolutionary uh, current were two black men, uh, William Davidson and Robert Wedderburn. Now, Robert Wedderburn gave a meeting to working-class Londoners in 1819 in which he won support for, from the audience for the right of a slave to kill a slave master. Imagine it, a white working-class audience... Uh, listening and supporting and enthusiastically this black revolutionary who proposes that black slaves have the right to kill their white masters. And this at a time when the ruling class was trying to put forward this view, trying to convince white workers that black people were subhuman, that uh, black people were somehow different, that belonging to your own race and nation was, was uh, natural. Now this revolutionary anti-tradition, uh, anti-racist tradition, was to be carried on in, in the largest mass movement uh, against the government in the 1840s, the Chartists. The Chartists took on the whole question of anti-Irish racism in Britain and, and their role in Ireland. Uh, in London, one of the most prominent, uh, important leaders of the Chartists was a black man, William Cuffley. He was so important to the Chartists that the Times, the, the press, the bourgeois press, attempted to ridicule the Chartists by calling them the black man and his party. Still again, still at the time, the ruling class trying to attempt to convince white workers that they are, uh, that black people are subhuman and that uh, there's a common, commonality of interest between all, everyone irrespective of class. But you saw that the vanguard of the British working class, especially in London, was actually, be, uh, was actually prepared to be led by a black man. Now people like Cuffey, People like Weatherburn are examples of a very important phenomenon. They show that when the working class is struggling, when the workers are fighting the real enemy, then it's possible to undercut racist ideas. When workers fight, they need the maximum unity. And discrimination on the lines of colour, race, sex, sexuality, whatever, becomes a direct hindrance to that uh, unity. That's the potential of the organised working class is phenomenal. Not only do they have the capability and interest to fight racism, they, but also to do away with capitalism itself. The, the system which gave rise to racism and which needs it precisely to, to weaken its potential power of workers.